And we're back. Welcome, everybody. This is Lecture 1C, our third lecture in Lecture 1. And in Lecture 1C, the objectives that we're going to touch on are leprechauns. I promise it'll make sense in a minute. Uh, we're going to take a look at the uh, observational tips that um, would help you to increase your ability to gather better information with your senses. So that's, you know, remember by definition, we're saying observation is just information you've gathered with your five senses. And uh, hopefully you're at a point where you realize that there's an awful lot of value of being good at gathering good information or uh, making those observations. And then we'll wrap it up with uh, looking at the importance and an example of how uh, documentation or uh, quality note taking can uh, pay some huge dividends and uh, what you're able to not only observe and gather, but later recall and use. So a uh, bit of review from uh, when we looked at the eyewitnesses. Remember, we said there's a lot of factors that would make a good eyewitness. And by definition, eyewitness, it's a little misleading. I mean, I get eye, you know, like you see with your eyes. An eyewitness isn't necessarily someone who's seen something. It could be someone who saw something, but we're using the definition of an eyewitness is someone who's observed something and can communicate it. So that communication, we've also looked at that with, you know, where you try to describe a celebrity or, um, you know, in some of the labs where you're perhaps struggling to get the observations that you've made to someone else or the reverse of that could happen, right? I mean, maybe someone's giving quality information and the receiver just isn't picking up on what's being communicated. Um, we've looked at factors that would affect perception. So remember perception, I mean, you know, it's basically your opinion, right? That's your personal interpretation of your observations. And a lot of factors could help perception. You know, we've talked about how past perceptions could be helpful. But if, um, you know, someone is scared of certain people or certain things, or has a soft spot for certain people or certain things, or has uh, past experiences that are maybe positive or negative. Um, the list just kind of goes on and on how past perception can really affect someone's account. Um, you know, it basically kind of boils down to, yes, it's a matter of an opinion. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, I would just encourage you to where if you're trying to talk to an eyewitness, which I understand you're not forensic scientists as of just yet, but if you're trying to gather information from someone who saw something in your life, try to listen to what they're saying and filter out, is this more perception or is this more fact? Or if you're asking questions to try to get information in your life, um, you know, try to ask specific questions where they would have to answer them with fact, not perception. If it was just like, well, what did you think of him? Well, that's totally different than who was there, what was their name, what were they behaving like, did they do X, Y, or Z. So uh, sometimes you can actually kind of avoid some of the perception that you'd have to toss out uh, just by uh, making sure that your questions are carefully asked. So let's take a quick look at leprechauns. Crowds are coming by the dozens to get an up-close view at what some say is a piece of Irish folk folklore. Some people in the Crichton area of Mobile say a leprechaun has taken up residence in their neighborhood. A leprechaun. NBC 15's <laughs> Brian Johnson has more. Curiosity leads to large crowds in Mobile's Crichton community. Many of you bring binoculars, camcorders, even camera phones to take pictures. To me, it looks like a leprechaun to me. I got to do look up in a tree. Who else in the leprechaun say yeah? yeah! Eyewitnesses say the leprechaun only comes out at night. If you shine a light in its direction, it suddenly disappears. This amateur sketch resembles what many of you say the leprechaun looks like. Others find it hard to believe and have come up with their own theories and explanations for the image. My theory is it's casting a shadow from the other limb. Could be a crackhead that got hold to the wrong stuff and it told him to get up in a tree and play a leprechaun. We're going to get down to the bottom of this. You're still on there, guy. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, man. This guy helping to direct traffic says he's prepared for his encounter with the leprechaun. He's suited up from head to toe. This water's all spells right here. 
This is a special leprechaun flute, which has been passed down from thousands of years ago from my great-great-grandfather, who was Irish. I just came to help out. Others just came to get lucky in hopes a pot of gold may be buried under this tree. I'm going to run a backhoe and uproot that tree. I want to know where the gold is. I want the gold. Give me the gold. I want the gold. This is Brian Johnson, NBC 15 News. People will do anything <laughs> for a pot of gold. I mean, anything. You know what I like? I like the amateur sketch of the leprechaun. Yeah, it looks like somebody yeah. got a really good look at it and got that good drawing out Who there. did that? I want to know who sketched that. I don't know. Maybe Brian sketched it. <laughs> Doodle it. <laughs> that was a good story. Yikes. Uh, so, a lot to digest there, huh? Um, you got a situation where there's an awful lot of eyewitnesses who say they saw a leprechaun in a tree. They say it. Does that make it true? I don't think so. Does that make it untrue? No. You've got all sorts of theories. So if you were to talk to a bunch of different people, you would get a bunch of different versions, right? You've got from, I saw a leprechaun, to it could just be a shadow cast from limbs, to a crackhead in a tree. Um, you know, you've got some individuals that claim to have expertise in uh, the, the background of leprechauns. Um, you know, apparently he had a, a special flute and, uh, you know, uh, some things to ward off spells. So you bring in that expert. Uh, that guy claims to be an expert. Does that necessarily make him credible? You've got some people who have tried documentation. Uh, you've got sketches that are being passed along. Um, you got a lot going on here, right? So I think that you could call into question some eyewitnesses' credibility, right? Because, I mean, if it's running the gambit there from, yeah, I saw a leprechaun to I think it's just a shadow to it's someone up in a tree, um, there can't be five different versions of the truth. So you may have to figure out what is it that most people are saying and then perhaps start to kind of work your way backwards from there. Uh, you might want to ask yourself, did these people have past perceptions of what they thought would occur? You know, if this is kind of like the hot spot where everyone goes to see the leprechaun and you're going there anticipating seeing one, uh, perhaps that's kind of tricking your brain into thinking or seeing some things that you want to versus what you did. Um, did they jump to conclusions because of those past perceptions? Is the documentation quality? Are the eyewitnesses credible? These are all questions that, you know, would have to get called into um, question here, right? So uh, I'm not going to tell you what my personal beliefs are. I'll let you arrive at your own conclusions. But uh, from that case, you know, what, what do you think probably happened and why? More important what you think and then be able to defend it as the why. So your book talked about how... Uh, there's a, a technical definition for forensics, and we were saying, okay, well, forensics is using scientific knowledge to answer legal questions, and I'm still going to roll with that, but uh, the term forensics actually comes from a Latin word of a forensis, which uh, means of the forum, and uh, way back when, uh, in the forum is where ideas were debated, so if there was a dispute or an argument or a confrontation that they had to kind of get to the bottom of. They would have people in the forum debate their ideas. And then the most convincing case won, which isn't really too far off from what our court systems look like today. But we're going to just kind of step out of just the court systems here and look at what a forensic scientist would do. They're really only concerned with what would stand as evidence. So I know sometimes if you're watching TV programs, they've got the forensics investigator that's, you know, pitching the idea on the stand and then out at the crime scene and then, you know, back in the lab and then hunting down witnesses. And that's a little bit more dramatic than what it would be. A uh, forensic scientist is responsible for an awful lot of things, but they're really only concerned with evidence that stands as fact. So they may say this person's DNA was found on this piece of clothing and there's a 99.99999% chance that it's a match. But they're not going to come out and say, well, they obviously killed them because their blood was there. That's where the lawyers come in to debate those facts. The, the forensic scientist is just there to gather the fact. Now, could you take fact and start to piece together a 
plausible story of what happened? Certainly. But, you know, the forensic scientist role isn't just that. It's going to be the, the lawyers or the prosecutors or perhaps even the detectives that have to pull together the different bits to come up with what they think actually had occurred from those facts that the, came from the evidence that the forensic scientists gathered. So there were some tips that I wanted to go through with you on how to be a good observer. And uh, one is to be systematic. And I'm going to bounce around a little bit here from forensics to perhaps what would be considered a little bit more of your day-to-day -day affairs. You know, systematic, right? That sounds all fancy pants. What's it mean? It just means to have a system. So if you've got a system of doing something, if you've got a set procedure or you've got protocol that you follow, I don't care if it's, this is how I get ready to go to the gym. And you've just got a system as to how you mentally prepare or pack your bag or get your post-workout materials together or whatever it is that you happen to be doing, if you've got a system that you follow, it's going to do an awful lot of good. And here's what I mean by that. If I've got a system for how I get up to where I get out in the morning and I have worked on it and I tweak it, it's going to prevent me from making errors because I know that like, if I follow this system or I'm systematic in my approach, I'm going to minimize my chances of making mistakes because I follow my step-by-step-by-step -step -step procedure. It's also going to force me to really focus and concentrate on what I'm doing. If I know I have to be doing a certain task, then another task, and then another task, I'm focused. I, I see that task clearly, and I concentrate. I stick with it until it's done. So having a system is obviously beneficial for forensic scientists, but if you find that you are, are forgetting things or sometimes it's just stuff's taking too long or you've got some uh, troubles in your life, if it's something you have to do time and time again, perhaps coming up with a system or being systematic in your efforts would uh, benefit you. How good are your powers of observation? The playing cards are going to be dealt from the top of the deck onto the table. How many red cards are dealt? If you said 15, congratulations. But did you see the secret message on the back of the cards? This awareness test brought to you by The Mentalist. CBS Tuesdays this fall after NCIS. Watch closely. Bah, tricky, tricky, right? So are you a bad observer if someone gave you a task of counting the red cards and you missed those messages. Not necessarily. I mean, you know, I think you could make the argument that you were so focused and concentrated on the given task that uh, you just didn't pay attention to the backs of the cards because if your task was to look for the red cards, that's actually just things you want to push out. But, you know, we've talked too about how you have to have a balancing act. you got to weigh things out a little bit where you don't want your area of focus to be so small and so precise that you miss some of those details that could be on the outlying uh, areas. So uh, it's tricky, right? You know, and sometimes you can miss some of those details if you don't have some flexibility in how you're observing. So uh, we've talked about turning off filters. And uh, that just basically goes to, you know, you don't want to go into something immediately trying to figure out what it was that you thought may have happened or having any, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, way of looking at it to where it's going to obscure your ability to just go in and gather fact. Uh, you know, I get when you see a picture like this, it's like, well, what happened? You know, man, there's an axe. I wonder if there was a struggle. Is the guy, you know, we, we don't know. I mean, I think if you're looking at a picture like this, it could be everything from a gentleman chopping wood that went to sit down and had a heart condition to perhaps there was some nefarious bad activity that took place and this is an actual crime scene. But you don't know. If you go into it with the filters of like, well, when people are in this position, there is always a crime, I think you might be jumping to some conclusions. And we'll uh, look at how step three tells us not to jump to conclusions. Uh, don't try to just make connections unless the facts or your evidence that you've gathered send you there. And what I mean by that is, 
you know, if you think something and then you find facts to prove that, believe it or not, you might have a tendency to bend the facts a bit to go to what you want them to prove. And uh, that's not the way I would recommend doing it. I think you'd be a lot better off if you hold off on your judgment. And that may mean that, you know, you keep your cool or you don't, you know, flip out on somebody or you don't make an impulse decision and you just gather the evidence and in time weigh it out and then come to a conclusion because the facts connected you there rather than trying to have a you know, idea of what you think must have happened and then backtracking it and finding an evidence to fit that. So uh, jumping to conclusions and no bueno. So uh, with being a good observer, uh, you should be good at documenting and recording what you've observed. Uh, we've talked about how memories can be faulty and uh, time is not our friend. Uh, the longer the time goes on, the foggier people's memories get, or you know they've got some bad information that could be coming in, or different information that could be coming in, and that could seep into their memory, and it can get pretty tricky to pull that apart. So you know, just imagine if I said, "Oh, hey, uh, from second trimester, um, your your final exam scores got lost. We're just gonna take those exams again real quick." I don't think you'd score as well, right? I mean, you know, quite a bit of time's gone on and you've probably lost some of that sharp detail that you had at one point. Uh, another great thing about being a good observer and making those documentations or basically taking notes, if I write something down as it's happening, um, that forces me to really focus and concentrate on what it is that I'm trying to gather. You know, when you take a pen or pencil physically to paper and write things out, you're making that forced decision to focus and concentrate on what it is that you actually think is important and you don't want to forget and you want to be able to recall later. So we take notes in class, right? Why? Well, because it forces you to stay focused and concentrated throughout a lecture and you can use this information at a later date. And if taken properly, it should be as accurate as the moment that you heard it the first time. Here's a bunch of information. Now, if uh, you were an investigator and somebody came in and said, all right, a guy named James Steele came in and it was the uh, 13th or 14th of April. It was around 7, 7.30 in the p.m. Uh, James, he, he's a white guy. He stands about 5 foot 10. He weighs in about 185 pounds. He's got uh, brown eyes and kind of like a short marine sort of buzz cut. Um, he gave his address. He said he lives at uh, 18730 Copper Pot Lane out in uh, Rochester Hills. Um, he drove a white Malibu, and I got to look at the plate number. It was RDU581. So that's a lot of information. What do you remember from it? Try to write down some of the information that I just gave you. I'll give you 30 seconds to write down everything from that information that I just gave you. Okay, so ballpark, roughly 30 seconds there. How'd you do? Did you get all those details? Do you think those details could be important if you were an investigator? Um, is there any of that information that you would just immediately discredit and say there's no way that that would be of importance? I mean, we don't have any real context here, but what I'm trying to get at is if I said, okay, look, I'm going to tell you this, but I need you to write this down now, and then... A week goes by, two weeks goes by, and I say, hey, check out those notes. This information is going to be as available then as it was you know, now. Uh, so I guess what I'm getting at is taking quality documentation, it, again, forces you to focus and concentrate, and you can recall that later and use it at a later date, and it should be just as accurate. Uh, now, may you, you might find that you have follow-up questions as you're writing this stuff down, too. But, um, you know, I think what you're hopefully starting to see here is that 
taking notes, it, it again, it forces you to focus and concentrate through an event and it gives you the ability to uh, recall that information later. So that's what I got for you. That's our uh, third lecture or lecture 1C of uh, unit one. And uh, hopefully you've got a decent understanding of rascally leprechauns running amok in Alabama. And, uh, you know, you've got a bit of a better understanding of the importance of documentation. And uh, you got some tips so that you can go out into the real world here and uh, become a better observer. If you've got questions or concerns, please let me know. Uh, until we meet again, be safe.